right, everyone. I believe this is our second lecture on Friday. I actually kind of forgot because I'm losing track. I have to film these about a week ahead of time so I can do all the video effects and whatnot. Now, I know you have an exam coming up, so I'll tell you what, no dinosaurs or any funny business this time. Let's just go ahead and do the lecture. We have another lecture on Monday, Wednesday, a review session. Of course, Friday is, is the deal. Now, I haven't quite worked out yet how we're going to do the exam, but don't worry, I will figure it out. I will have emailed you with plenty of time, which should be soon. Uh, but again, uh, soon for you is one week, but for me it's two weeks because, again, I film these ahead of time. So sorry to, sorry to be daft about that. Anyway, let's see. We gotta, I want to still review what we did last time because I don't presume that you're necessarily watching these in order. I hope you are keeping up. But I know that two lectures back to back is, is a bit onerous. You know, in business school, our classes are three hours straight, by the way. But you only do them once a week. It, it is, I'm used to it at this point. You do get used to it. Anyway, anyway. All right, so what are we talking about? Last time, sorry, not last time. Let's, let's stick, skip to the beginning. On Monday, when we started talking about quantum mechanics, and I mentioned how quantum mechanics, the Schrodinger equation, is a differential equation. And in this case, it's like an eigenvalue equation. I've got to take, I've got to, I've got to like take the double derivative of this function and get the double, and get the function to come back. I've got, I've got to get it to boomerang back. It's okay if it's multiplied by a scalar. Remember that fancy word, scalar, which is just a number? It's okay if it's multiplied by a scalar, because that scalar actually tells you something. In the case of the Hamiltonian operator, it tells you the energy. Now, what we talked about last time was this is actually one example out of many. And so I'm writing down an eigenvalue equation, but I'm using different symbols. Those symbols are to represent the fact that there's, there's multiple operators. Here's a bunch that we talked about last time. Hamiltonian is simply one of them. So this is like a generic operator. And as I mentioned last time, you can't assume that the function that works with the, the whatever operator, you can't assume that it's the same as the Hamiltonian's wave function. So it's still the same idea though, operator, eigenfunction, eigenvalue, which I'm use a different symbol because it's not necessarily energy. Um, eigenvalue, eigenfunction, right? So it's still an eigenvalue equation, but it's been genericized because we can have all kinds of functions, right? So the Hamiltonian is the first one you were introduced to. That's because it's considered special. It's, it's a little on the easier side to understand. It's what Schrodinger developed first. And the functions that are good with it, I, I give them that special symbol. I call them wave functions. And for the other deals of other operators, I tend to call them eigenfunctions. And I do that to differentiate them. But, but that's a little artificial. And I will often make mistakes. I, I will still call these things eigenfunctions. And remember, I also may call them eigenvectors. Um, they're all eigenfunctions, eigenvectors, wave functions, but I tend to call this one eigenfunction, and I tend to call that one wave function. I try to do that. Again, because we think of the wave functions of the Hamiltonian as being special in ways that the others are not. We think of them as being the, the, the representation of the, let's say, hydrogen atom of the free wave, this is the representation that represents reality. Okay. Hamiltonian, there's position operator. We, did, we talked a little bit about momentum operator. In a month, we'll be doing rotational stuff. So this is rotational momentum. Uh, we talked about flux. That's on your homework, like Maxwell Boltzmann. So this is how you can calculate flux. And the operator is just taking the, the wave function and doing this to it. Okay, and the way I try to represent that is with this little Venn diagram here, that the guys that are okay with the Hamiltonian may or may not be okay with a different operator. With the example being, I may know, I, I always want Hamiltonian wave functions. I always want to get to those. Because now I know the energy, and that usually allows me to do spectroscopy, and it's, it's usually the most useful one. Sometimes I may want to know the momentum. And as you saw last time, you may or may not get the eigenfunction thing to work, the, the eigen equation. In which case, you've got a bit of a problem. Now, let me remind you of that. Uh, last time, I did 
Hamiltonian of sine, sine of kx. But to get a little bit more mathematical here, I'm going to alter this. I want to do this with I want to do this with the complex representation of sine. And it's, it's going to work out just fine. I just want you to get used to this because we're going to do a lot of things. Uh, a lot of complex functions are going to be coming up. And remember, I told you that you need to do it this way because you're going to do things in one step. If I didn't do it this way, it's going to be 10 steps. I mean, I know you're not quite used to this, but, but get used to it because otherwise, the, the otherwise is, is really quite awful. Okay, so um, you know, here let me let me wipe that off my own work. I try not to do that, but I just did it. Okay, constants and double derivative. And all I do is I do the double derivative on each function, and I know it's a little confusing to one over two i. So what I'll do there is uh, here. Let me. I'm not using the more too well. Uh, let's see. Let's write over two m. I can actually factor out the two uh, two m the, the two i. I can just bring that out front for i m. I'll bring that out front right now. It's actually not the best idea, and you'll see why in a second. Uh, what what I've just done is as much as I've just factored this out, and the reason that that's nice here, you'll see in a second. Now let me just write all this down. That's why I like. Actually, doing videos is I can if if I have a lot of dead silence, you know, I just speed, speed up the video anyway. Okay, so if if you, you look at this and like, oh wait, I don't know how to do the derivative of that. I'm pretty sure you know how to do the derivative of this. Just factor the two i out, right? So not not too bad. We know that you're a lot of you are still like I'm. I've forgotten a lot, or, or I haven't seen this before. Fine, I get that. That's why I'm doing this. But now you've seen it. Right, so going forward, you, you should be able to do this. Okay, all right, now what? Let's do the double derivative. And again, factoring that little 2i made this part easier, but you're going to see that we're actually going to have a little complexity injected in. Okay, all this thing does is it brings, out, brings down i k twice, so that's minus k squared. And then I've... Um, Got oh well here here let me let me keep it right let me keep it factored yeah I, I wasn't thinking there okay then um, oh god okay <laughs> all right yeah this is this is a rough this is kind of rough to do in your head okay I'm gonna bring down minus i k times minus i k okay the minus is cancel minus minus plus uh, so I still got a minus sign from i squared, then I got a minus sign here, and I got a k squared. I know that was a little rough. Maybe, maybe just write it down and just be very slow and methodical. All right, it's not that bad, right? Okay. Uh, yeah, there you go. All right, now. All right, this has been easy up to this point. Now, now let me play it where it gets kind of hard. To make this an eigenvalue equation, I've got got to remember that that's squared, uh, I've got to return the function, right? I've got to return the function. So to do that, watch what I'm going to do. I am going to factor minus k, uh, I'm going to factor a minus k squared out, so minus minus plus, and I'm going to leave a 2m in front, and then that leaves e to the i k x minus e to the minus i k x. Remember, I factored out minus k squared, so that's why that's plus and that's minus. And I'm going to take a factor of 2i and put it back in, which is the original wave function. And right, this is the original wave function. And that makes us the i value. Okay. So you see that uh, I'm able to I'm able to make it work right here. Here's the here's the wave function. Here's the operator. Here's the eigenvalue. Here's the wave function. Right, everything worked out fine. Where it got a little complicated was 
One thing that's not so good about this method is that you can get kind of confused uh, about where your wave function is, right? From when I went from here to here, it's like, where's my wave function? I had to do kind of some decently complex algebra to, to, to you know, make the wave function go away, but then it has to come back. Um, algebra is still algebra, right? It's very doable, but anyway, you just, you just saw what I did. It's not that bad. This would definitely be at the more complex end of the question at the exam, but anyway. All right, now, what's the point of this? Now, let's go ahead and do momentum, which you know will fail, by the way. You know that this is going to fail. So here's the momentum operator, um, and let me, I'll, I'll write this down a different way, just because I can. Uh, this is still, Okay, so there's the wave function. Uh, the operator we know is h bar over i. Oh, here, if you, if you don't mind, let me, let me just, it saves me a lot of time, all right? So, okay, so there's the momentum, there's the wave function, what do we get? And, you know, now you know what I can do? I'm actually not gonna factor that 2i out. I'm not gonna do that, because for all the reasons you just saw. Okay, so what do I get? I k over 2i um, minus minus plus okay so now what um, now what I can do is I gotta get the wave function back so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, factor out an ik, so what I end up with is h bar k uh, e to the ikx plus e to the minus ikx over 2i, uh, which actually, you know what, I see if I factor an i out, I end up with Cos kx, right? So, so you see, momentum times sine ends up being uh, an, an eigenvalue h bar k over i times cosine. So, so again, we already sorry, we already know this. We already and we did this last time, right? If I take the momentum operator and operate on sine which ends up with this h bar over i k cos. Okay, so the point of this, the point of this was to show you that this one fails, right? So, so even if I do it in a complex way, even if I do it in a complex way, um, it fails, and if I do it this way, it fails. So it seems like there, there's no solution, right? Now, Solving this, getting this to actually work, and I've already told you the answer is that this has no momentum. So I have to get that out of it. Let me preview. Let me preview a little bit about why I'm able to actually get this information. Like right now, everything it fails. This failed, like from last lecture. I tried converting it to the complex functions, and it still failed. And of course, it did. Let me point out something. Let me point out something. Had I done this, let me do this. Let me go back here, and I am going to write it out this way. And so now what? H bar over I. I uh, let me. Um, you, you know what I could do? Uh, yeah. You know what I could do? I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some factoring. So. So let's see here. So I've got h bar k e to the i k s minus um, minus h bar k e to the minus i k x all over two i. And you see. You see, it actually still looks like sine, right? E to the ikx minus e to the minus ikx over 2i. It's like these guys, these guys, it's like h bar k 
uh, e to the i k x over 2i minus minus h bar k e to the minus i k x over 2i. Now, what I'm seeing here are like little wave functions and little eigenvalues. Right? So these are like little wave functions, two different wave functions, and two different eigenvalues, right? So you see that? Sorry, let me get out of the way. So it looks like sine, if I think of this e to the ikx and e to the minus ikx as like two different wave functions, what I'm getting is I'm getting those same wave functions back in an eigenvalue, and I'm getting this wave function back, e to the minus ikx, and I'm seeing it over 2i, I'm seeing it come back, and it has a different eigenvalue. And notice that what happens is if I sum those eigenvalues, I get zero. h bar k uh, minus h bar k, well, that's zero. Okay. Now, I don't expect you to follow this. I'm just pointing out that what may happen is that the answer is hiding inside of the function. Now, to make this a, a lot more clear, I know this is probably absurd what I just did. To make this clear, um, the answer to make this work is to do something called an expectation value. Expectation value. Okay. Now, expectation values are going to work like I just showed you. Uh, this is a preview. Uh, we're going to revisit this exactly like this at the end of the lecture. We're going to revisit this within this paradigm of expectation value, which, by the way, is basically a Maxwell-Boltzmann approach. All right, so how does that work? What we're going to do is we're going to, and let's represent this like a Maxwell-Boltzmann with an average value. So it's like an average value, except that being quantum mechanical, it's called something different. Okay, so what is this? Uh, well, normally I would have, for Maxwell-Boltzmann, I would have the probability distribution function. Right? Uh, the absolute value of the, of the eigenfunction. Um, so, so we're cut here. Let, let, me, let me back up, right? Now, I told you at the very beginning that this is the probability density, or this is how a wave function is related to the probability density. But seeing how you see that we're really, uh, really immersed in complex this and that, complex functions, uh, you know that it's actually uh, the function times its complex conjugate. And you usually put the complex conjugate on the left. So I, I think I got that reversed earlier, so sorry about that. Okay, but then, all right, so this is the probability density. What is the thing you're trying to take the average value of? Well, it's this operator. Uh, so now an operator has to operate on a wave function. It has to be to the left of the wave function. So we're going to do something a little funky. I'm going to put the operator here, and then I'm going to write the, the eigenfunction there. And let's just assume that we're, you know, dx. We're not going to worry about y and z, any of that. Okay, so it's the same idea as Maxwell Boltzmann. Probability density with the thing you want the average of, right? Now, now again, I have to do something a little funky. I have to, I have to because I'm working with operators, the operator uh, can't, you know, can't be by itself, right? That doesn't it just inherently doesn't make sense. So I have, to, I have to do one weird thing, I have to write it out this way. And of course, we have to do all limits. So uh, instead of writing all limits, I'll just put infinity minus infinity to infinity. OK. So, so again, I hope that you can see as closely as possible how this is analogous to a Maxwell-Boltzmann average using uh, probability density with the only funkiness of being the way that you insert this operator in here. And I can't, I don't know that I have like a proof for that. It just, it, it is what it is. Actually, I kind of do have a proof, but let's actually go, with, before I do anything like that, let's do our, let's go back to our sign. And uh, so let's say that this is our sine kx. And I'm going to go back to the uh, trig form. And, and I'm going to revisit this complex form again later. It's the reason I did that. Uh, let's see here. All right, so now if that's the case and our operator is momentum, 
Therefore, and now again, remember, remember the, the, the whole goal here was that we know that sine is okay with the Hamiltonian. It's, it's a free wave function, but I wanted to get the momentum. I got a bunch of junk, um, and so I'm pretty sure it's zero. It's zero for all the reasons I said here, but I know that this is like really hard to look at. Okay, but I'm pretty sure it's zero. This is going to show me that it's zero, so let's figure that out. Okay, so I've got, oh, that, that, that doesn't look good, that bothers me. There we go. Okay, I've got, and let, let's not worry about normalization constants for all, again, normalization is weird for free waves. Uh, let's not worry about it. Uh, H bar over I. And you know there's software that you can type all of this into and it will do it for you. Uh, what we're going to do is when you do problems like this, I'll break it down into like part A, part B, part C that you'll plug into those software so it's a little bit easier. So like, uh, so this is our expression, but let's, let's do the derivative first, right? So you can imagine if you're, if you're doing this all online, you're, um, you're typing it first, oh, what's the derivative? Of course, the derivative of cosine is minus, sorry, it's sine, it's sine. You see, I got ahead of myself and see how I did that. Derivative of sine is cosine uh, k. Sine is cosine, cosine is minus sine. Okay. Now, as usual, why don't we take all the constants out? There's our h bar k over i. We always, we always get that sucker right. Uh, and we know that it's not right. In fact, I know that the answer is 0. And the way I know that, again, is that this expectation value deal is going to be the thing that gives me that information. And it turns out that, and I hate to do this to you, but you need to be a little on the sophisticated side of mathematics to know that sine times cosine integrated to infinity and beyond, it turns out that this guy is zero. So there you go. So the average momentum, just like I've been you know, foreshadowing for a lecture and a half now, the average momentum of the sine function turns out to be zero, so it's not moving. Oh, it's not moving on average, right? This is an average value. Now, and I, I hate to do this to you, I don't like just telling you this is what it is accepted. The way to think about this is, is that sine and cosine are waves that are separated, right? They're not like the same wave, but they're offset. That sets up an interference pattern that varies between plus and minus, plus and minus. So in integrals, you're used to our sums of areas. So basically what happens is the area never really converges to anything. And technically, these are normalized and one over infinity. So it ends up being zero. So again, this is like, a, to, to, to do these kinds of deals, you have to use a little bit more special calculus. Like, remember how you had to, like when you're doing limits, you use the Alpital's rule, where you, when you can't figure out the limit of something, you figure out the limit of its derivative. Anyway, there are some calc tricks that you run into when you have problems. This is one of them. But just please accept that it's an interfering wave that the integral just doesn't ever really accumulate in the area, so therefore it's zero. Okay, so, and again, the bigger picture is when you have this problem of the guy of the wave function not being okay with the other operator, the way you do it is with this expectation value wave, which is very Maxwell Boltzmann like with this little bit of weirdness in here. Uh, and I'm telling you, it always works. It will work every time. Okay, so, um, and I can tell you that for the most part, for the most part, most textbooks, especially like the biochem version, I'm pretty sure your version does this, never even shows you how to do, expect, uh, it never even shows you uh, eigenvalue equations. It never even shows you this. It always just shows you this. Because, by the way, this will always work. This always works. So some textbooks pretend that eigenvalue equations don't even exist. They just say, oh, this is how you do it, just accept it. Uh, but I, again, it just doesn't sit well with me. All right, now, let's go a little further with this. And, and again, 
I really want you to get used to e to the ikx, e to the minus ikx for reasons that will become stunningly apparent as I do example after example, even like right now. Okay, as you can see here, I have to wipe out the board. Uh, one of these days, I'll show you what happens when I'm, when I'm doing this. It gets quite exciting. Just give me one moment. Okay, we're back. All right, so a little bit more about expectation values. Let's go back to, again, our free wave, and we've still got hmm, one more week of just talking about free waves. I've mentioned how like, we know the Hamiltonian is just a kinetic operator. We know that sine and cosine work. But now let me add two more. <laughs> the thing I keep talking about, e to the ikx and e to the minus ikx. The free wave has four solutions, these four right here. Uh, we've talked at length about sine and cosine. Let's do e to the ikx. Why not? So let's do the Hamiltonian operator on that particular solution. And handwriting is a little off today, but not too bad. I think last time my handwriting was a bit worse. Okay, so we have got to see uh, this function come back. Now I know that the double derivative of e to the ikx is going to be i squared k squared, and so that's minus k squared. So minus k squared minus h bar squared is h bar squared k squared. You may notice that h bar squared k squared is like the solution to everything. Almost every one of our problems has been h bar squared k squared over 2 m when it comes to the Hamiltonian. And of course, when you take a differential of an exponential, it always comes back, right? So this is kind of obvious. <laughs> double derivative of cosine is cosine, minus cosine. Double derivative of sine is minus sine. It always comes back. Derivatives of exponentials, they always come back. D3, D4, D5 differentials, they always come back, right? So these are good solutions. Okay, so the Hamiltonian of uh, the ikx is h bar squared k squared over 2 m. Now, let's see about this. Now, remember I was telling you that sometimes the wave functions work with the Hamiltonian and something else, and sometimes they don't. You just saw, you just saw an example of one that didn't. What about this one? h bar over i, a single derivative, single derivative of exponential. You know, ikx, I just, I just mentioned. Take the derivative of an exponential, it always comes back. So what do we got? I got h bar i k over i, that's h bar k. Oh, well, look at that. It worked. It worked. e to the i k x, and so is e to the minus i k x. These are examples of ones that are, are, that are OK with both the Hamiltonian and momentum. Sine and cosine are not. e to the i k x and e to the minus i k x are OK. Now, we even learn a little something about this. The eigenvalue of momentum is, is positive, right? h bar k is positive. If I did e to the minus i k x, the eigenvalue would have been minus h bar k, and that's negative. Well, that has some interpretation. Um, so this, you know, one of the things about quantum mechanics is that it tells you everything, but it, it doesn't like write it down. What it's not writing down is, I am moving to the right. E to the ikx is, is a right-moving particle because its momentum is positive. And I say that because e to the minus ikx has a negative momentum up here. Let me, let me just write that down. Um, I don't want to leave you hanging. That's minus h bar k. I'm sorry, that's negative, right? So the eigenvalue for momentum of e to the minus ikx is minus h bar k. So that is a left way, right? It doesn't spell out I am left, but you should know that positive momentum in the x-axis is moving to the right, and negative momentum on the x-axis is moving to the left. So now I understand what the purpose of these wave functions are. They're to describe particles moving left and right. Now, using the expectation value way for sine, and it would have Cosine is the same. It, it all works exactly the same. I think hopefully that's obvious. Uh, I cannot do this approach with sine, but I can do expectation value and get the fact that sine is actually for something that has kinetic energy. It does have kinetic energy, but it's not moving, it's not on average the momentum is zero, right? So on average it's moving left and right equally. Uh, and the same is true of cosine. So let me repeat that. 
Right wave, left wave, um, cosine and sine are not moving at all. Uh, sorry, they're not, not that they're not moving at all. They have, they have energy, they have kinetic energy. But with that said, tell you what, let me, let me just try to explain this a little bit better by um, going over, I don't know where am I at? Um, I want to prove, uh, I want to circle back to this expectation value. So I know this lecture, at the end of this lecture, all of this will make sense. I know it seems like I'm, I'm like a cat chasing string, but I'm introducing all this stuff in an order for a reason, but you'll have to wait to the end, it will all make sense. Okay, in terms of a proof of the expectation value, let me do this. And let's just assume dx, everything's in dx, and let's just assume you go from infinity to minus infinity. Now, recall that the eigenvalue equation deal is this. Right? So notice I can insert this here and write uh, eigenvalue, here's the function. Right? I'm just using that, putting that in there, right? It's unbelievably simple. Okay, uh, sorry, I <laughs> gave myself in a hole here. Uh, so what, so what? Okay, next step. I, I, I'm going very, very slow. Some of you are very mathematical and probably already see the answer. I'm going to take the wave function out. Again, don't forget the limits. I'm not writing them down right now. And hopefully you notice I'm just going to go ahead and finish it here. All right, now, you remember how wave functions are normalized? You assume that this is normalized. So, what you're left with, there you go. So there you go, there's a proof about how these expectation values, which again are basically average values from Maxwell Boltzmann, they're basically the same thing. But for quantum mechanics, they're called expectation values, they have this difference, and then we see how it works, right? Here's what I like about that. Remember how I got into a messy situation more towards the beginning where I had applied, um, God, what, I forgot what operator already. I applied an operator to the e to the i kx, e to the minus e to the minus i kx, and I got myself to an algebra problem, and I had to, I, had, I put constants in, I took them out, and, and anyway, it was kind of a bloody mess. Here's what's kind of awesome about expectation values is that you don't have to try to juggle constants around. The result of this operation is the eigenvalue by itself. You don't have to like untangle the eigenvalue from a wave function like you do with the eigenvalue approach. The expectation value approach simply spits out the eigenvalue. So again, you may recall when I used this last time on the sine function, how I told you like, I'm going to make it a little bit easier, but, but I'm going to actually complicate it in another way. And the reason was is because I had a tough time untangling the eigenvalue from the eigenfunction. And here, you avoid that, right? You just get the clean weight of eigenvalue just spits right out. Now, the problem, though, is that it comes at the expense of doing all these integrals, right? Or one integral, but anyway, I don't like doing integrals, right? This guy is kind of cool by itself. <laughs> Aside from the example I just showed, I actually prefer to do things this way because I just don't like doing integrals. Although I do believe this has its merits. Anyway, that's actually it, except for this. Recall at the very uh, halfway, 10 minutes ago, we did the sine example. And we did it as e to the ikx minus e to the minus ikx over 2i. It was a bloody mess. It was unresolvable. Of course it is. We did it with expectation value, and we got the correct answer of zero momentum for, a sign, for our, our sign free wave. And so we did it this way. Here's the problem. The whole point of doing the expectation value wave for the sine function was that this did not work when this was sine. Right? So if this doesn't work, then this doesn't work either. Do you see that? Again, I solved the sine momentum to get zero using the expectation value approach. 
But notice that the derivation of the approach, the, the, the approach that it works, is predicated on this working which it did not work in the case of sign. So I've gone back in time and shot my own grandfather, and now I don't know what happens, right? So you kind of see that? All right, now, the last part of this lecture is to resolve this. And maybe we're gonna end a little early, but that's okay, because this, this is one of the harder ones. All right, the goal here of the next step is to show that even though this fails from the sign, for the, the case of sign kx, this failed. I've shown that in many ways now. And then we did this, and I'm telling you it works. But it's not clear why it works. If this doesn't work, then this derivation doesn't work. But I'm telling you it did work. Well, why? I'm going to show you that now. Just don't, just don't lose sight of that, because I know that all these integrals and the of the ikx is they just kind of like fleas on a dog. Uh, it does kind of drive me a little bad stuff. All right, now why does it work? Whoops, sorry, everyone, camera mistake. All right, now let's see, where was I at? Okay, so what I'm going to do is write down, we're going we're to look at the sine wave. Again, remember, it's an eigenfunction of the Hamiltonian. And, and I've done this to death, but you're going to look at it with a new pair of glasses right now. Uh, again, you, you've seen this here. I'm like, why am I writing this down again? Because of this. Sine is the function of the Hamiltonian, but it's not a momentum. E to the i k x and e to the minus i k x are okay with momentum and, and h, right? They are simultaneously states of momentum and, and the Hamiltonian. Notice that sine is composed of, a, it's a sum, right? minus is just the addition of something negative. It's basically a sum of wave functions that aren't okay with momentum, right? You see that? You're not okay with momentum, but this one is and this one is. And that's the key to figuring this out. So remember how I said that these guys hide that average momentum of zero inside of it? How, how the average momentum of sine is hiding that zero momentum? It's inside of it? That's why, because each one of these by themselves reports momentum. Now, to make that, you know, we have to make this exactly, you know, this mathematical proof that's perfect. The way you do that is this. All right, again, let's say wave function, wave function of the Hamiltonian, so we use psi. And what, what you can always do, by the way, when you have this problem of you've got a wave function of the Hamiltonian, but you're not able to calculate momentum, or something else, or angular momentum, or flux, or, or I don't know. There's so, there's so many of these operators, by the way, but we're going to just stick with momentum. It turns out that you can always write a wave function in terms of other wave functions. So in this case, sine is not OK with momentum, but I can write it as some kind of combination of states that are OK with momentum. Right? So that's, that's the point here. Now let's simplify that by let's just make let's just make this two functions. So I'm going to call this um, uh, numbers one and number two, just like just like that, right? So there's two functions. Uh, there could be an infinite number for other problems, but in this case, in this case, you, you see the analogy. Uh, sine is composed of e to the i k x and e to the minus i k x. Right? So that's the idea. Okay, now let's look back at the average momentum. But we're going to write it out this way. And I also like this because it's more generic. It's not specifically for sine. Okay, so of course, integrate. Let's not worry about limits. That's going to make me throw up to keep writing the limits over and over again. Okay, so here's that. That's the definition of an average value. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert this expansion. And, okay, so that is C1. Maybe I'm going to speed up time. I don't think I need to speed up time. This isn't that bad. It's a little bad. Okay, especially because what happens when you have this thing in complex conjugate? I'll show you in a minute. Uh, there's not much to it. Actually, I'll just tell you. Uh, you take the complex conjugate of everything. That includes the constants. The constants can have I in it, too. They can be imaginary. If that sounds strange to you, this is an example, right? 
The function is e to the ikx. The constant is 1 over 2y. The function is e to the minus ikx. The constant is minus 1 over 2y, right? Let me just look at it. You can figure it out. OK, anyway, back to task. What about this? OK, each term is complex. This guy operates on the right. So you've seen that a bunch of times. Only, only to the guys immediately to the right. Like, like a derivative. OK, so let's just assume that, uh, OK, I, I still got, um, here we go. And again, each one of these is complex. Like, just like this example, you, you have a complex constant, and the function is also complex. Remember that this makes us even the minus ikx. And that makes this one e to the i kx, right? So wherever there's an i, you put a minus i. And if you have a minus i, then it becomes a plus i. OK, there's that. OK, now let's assume that we've operated on the, the guy to the right. So we have this i, you know, the, 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 the number is still there. There is the eigenvalue for that state. Here's the eigenvalue for the second state. Now you see the analogy to what I was doing before when I was talking about sine in the complex way. Uh, OK, so there you go. Now what we've got ourselves is a heck of a, a, heck of a little FOIL problem. And you, we're going to run into this a lot, by the way, because what I'm doing here right now, we're, we're going to kind of do this over and over and over again. Uh, right? So I know you're seeing it for the first time, but it won't be the last. OK, now what we do is we're going to FOIL it, and we're going to end up with four terms. And that is very unpleasant. All right, so what do we get? Okay, so I'm going to get a C1 star C1, which is the absolute value of the constant. And I get, now we assume that these things are normalized, by the way. Oh, oh that, that looks kind of awful, doesn't it? I'll tell you what, tell you what, let me write it down a little bit neater. There we go, that's a little bit better, isn't it? It doesn't matter what order you multiply these at this point. OK. And then we get another one that for, for, the, other, for the other function. And again, there's, this is just FOIL, right? This, that, this, that, 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 anyway, blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to have to, I, I didn't plan ahead very well. Because now I need to write the next two terms. And now there's cross terms, right? So I'm going to do this one, that one. Uh, um, so I just have to, I just have to, you know, be careful about keeping track of what. It's, it's an algebra problem, right? And then, um, oh, 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 oh my God! Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, see how I caught that when I, when I had to keep track. And, 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 and I forgot the eigenvalue. There's, um, okay, I did, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. You know, I should have just sped this up. If I sped it up, we wouldn't have noticed it. I could have, like, deleted it, deleted my mistakes. Okay, so I won't mess this one up. All right, speak to, um, what did I just do that one? So yeah, okay. C two C one. Uh, I get value one. Um, and you know, one way I can remember is that it's just basically got to produce every one of those. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Awful, isn't it? But we're almost through. Okay. Now, now let's, uh, let's break this down. And we'll, we'll maybe get it a little early. I have four terms. I have to do four integrals. And it may look like, like, well, I mean, these are a bunch of generic symbols. Actually, it's the solution. These are a bunch of constants. These are constants, and I'm integrating the absolute value of the normalized function. Right? Of course I am. That's one. So the first term is 
this absolute value of this coefficient, this weighing factor, times the first eigenvalue. Okay. Now, same deal here, that's the absolute value of this weighing factor. Now, let me, just, just so you know, all right. If, if I want to make this problem this problem, C1 is 1 over 2i, so the absolute value squared is 1 fourth, right? So that's 1 over 2i times 1 over 2i, which is minus 1 over 4, but absolute value, 1 over 4, right? Just so you understand that you can look at this and, and know what this is, all right? Then there's this guy, and same, same there. So C2 is minus 1 over 2i, but again, the absolute value, the square of the absolute value is 1 fourth. Okay, so that's this one and this one. Now I've got this one and this one. All right, now a little while ago, a little while ago, remember when we had sine and cosine, right? Those integrated to zero. Because there are ways that they interfere with each other. There are ways that are not the same way. If they're the same way, they normalize to one. If they're different ways, you're going to get an interference pattern and the integral will be zero. And again, you have to, I, don't think, I hate doing that to you, you have to kind of trust me that sine, cosine, integrate, zero. You have to trust me on that. But it turns out to be true just with any two ways that are not the same. I integrate any two ways, sine, cosine is an example of many. If I multiply them, I generate an interference pattern. It'll never integrate to anything, it's just zero. So this term is zero, that term is zero, that's the answer. Now, let me, hold on, before I go further, let me write that down. Any two functions that are not the same, and assume one's a complex conjugate, that, that doesn't matter, it, it doesn't matter which one's complex conjugate, if any two ways integrated will be zero. So this is the answer, right? Now, notice how you can interpret this. When a wave function is composed of eigenfunctions, you know, like little guys, what you get is the weighing coefficient, the absolute value of the weighing co coefficient, times its corresponding eigenvalue. Okay, now I don't have any similar way to describe that. In case that shot over your head, let's do an example. Let's do the example we just did like, like 10 freaking times already at this point. What's the weighing coefficient? We just talked about it. It's, it's 1 over 2i, the absolute value squared is 1 fourth. Right? What's the eigenvalue for momentum of e to the i k x? We just did it. It's h bar k. Right? I told you this would all make sense at the very end. Every bit of it. Okay. Next deal. Um, plus weighing coefficient, weighing coefficient squared, and minus one over two i. Minus one over two i. The absolute value is one fourth. But the eigenvalue is minus h bar k, because it's a left wave. There you go, right? See, it all worked out in, in, in this case. And remember how, I know that must have been ultra confusing, and I, I, I'm not even going to rewatch that. I have to rewatch the videos uh, for the effects, but I'm not going to rewatch that because I bet it's painful. Remember how I, was, I basically did this earlier, and I bet that was ultra confusing, but I bet you see it now, don't you? Um, and, and again, it's generic for, for any, any particular wave function that you could, you could have. Anytime you run into this problem of not being able to use the eigenvalue way, you can always use the expectation value way, and this is the proof why, and this is an example with sine. Okay, with that, I've hit my time limit. Uh, one more lecture, and that is that, and we've got our exam. So uh, with that, I will We'll tune off. We have Monday and have a good weekend. You should start studying now, no doubt. You should start studying now. This stuff is way too hard. And um, Monday I'll drop some hints on what's on the exam. And Wednesday is going to be hint central. I write the exams by the review session and I will intentionally tell you answers. I don't mean to, I just can't help myself. I will, on the review session, start spitting out answers to the exam because again, I can't help myself. All right, till then.